Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy, and welcome back to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health, one topic at a time. I'm going to stick to the same topic we've been on the last couple of videos, which is coronavirus. Is there any other topic in the world uh, right now? Not to make light of it, it's it's very concerning. And I'm just going to talk about what, what we're doing in our experience, um, what kinds of precautions we're taking in my home, and uh, what my thoughts are, my opinions on some things, and then I'm going to end with a couple of um, suggestions about things to do and, and, and something positive. I think we can all use that, just a couple of positive thoughts and suggestions. Um, so first of all, we have decided to pretty much, um, we've decided to do strict social distancing. And I don't want to use the word isolation. I think uh, that's that would be what most people would, what I'm doing would be what most people would call um, pretty much isolation, but in medical terms, isolation means you're infectious and you're being isolated and neither one of my husband or I, we're not sick. Um, everybody feels fine, thank goodness, but um, we have decided on strict social distancing. Um, we've actually been doing that for a week now. I, I guess all last week, my husband worked from home. I'm fortunate I, I haven't, I, I do, um, I'm an independent contractor in my work. I have my business and I, I just haven't taken on any work. I was actually supposed to be traveling this past week, so I was off anyway, but we didn't, we didn't travel. Um, so we have really been sticking around home. It's good and it's bad, right? It's, it's scary, but I, I think that uh, you know, I'm looking around at what different countries have done. A lot of different countries have behaved differently. And if you know, I think it's important to look at uh, what's already in the past in other countries so we can learn from them. And um, the one thing I will say is that I think it is insane to do something, to do the same thing and expect a different result. That's sort of the take home lesson, I think, when I look around the globe at the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we've decided to stay home. Uh, we have a few things that we're doing very differently. When we first decided to start the staying home, I kind of did a deep clean everywhere. I'm pretty clean anyway, I'm, um, uh, but I did do a deep clean and kind of went around sanitized, you know, light switches, doorknobs, all, all the things that are high touch, which again, I do anyway occasionally, but this is, I, I just did everything all at one time. And um, we decided that if we had deliveries come in and I'm going to go into like how I deal with the packages later, um, things are just going to be left on the porch. I don't want anybody, you know, ring, I'm not going to greet anybody at the door, who, you know, who rings the bell or anything like that. Um, and anybody, you know, who wanted to come here would really have to kind of be isolated for a couple of weeks before they would, not that that's an issue. Um, I went ahead and just laundered the kinds of things that get laundered occasionally, like a quilt, um, uh, things like that. As far as like pillows on the bed, I don't think those are really high risk because you change the cover, but I put pillows in the dryer. It just cuts down on allergens. I, I do that anyway every now and then. I put those in the dryer on high heat for 30 minutes or so. Um, so I kind of did a deep clean and then, you know, now I just have to keep it that way. But now I know there's no coming in and out. Okay. So my husband isn't going to the office. He's working from home. Um, I've restricted the clothing that I wear to things that pretty much go in the dryer. So it's just like one less thing to worry about. Um, and I've got packages all over the place. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, well, let's talk about it now. So packages, I've heard some people talk on YouTube and how they're handling packages and mail. Like, can this coronavirus survive on packages? And the truth is this, all the research on this thing is really new and we don't know, okay? We just don't know. Um, and on hard surfaces, it depending on who you read, it, it lasts three to nine days. So I've, I've seen, most of what I've seen says on something like cardboard, like you would receive from, uh, in the mail uh, box, on cardboard, it's up to 24 hours. But then, you know, what's inside that package and who's handled that? So I think it probably is really low risk to contract this thing. But one thing we know is this thing is extremely virulent. Uh, you can look at, you know, countries that have done very extreme measures and it, it still took a long time to get this thing to the curve to come down. So I, I don't think you can be too careful. And I guess I don't want to have to go through all the... Um, trouble of having sort of properly distanced myself socially just to do something, just to skip something easy and then worry about it. So I am handling packages in the following way. And there's a couple of options, but I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing. 
So any package that comes in that doesn't have to be open, like there's nothing perishable in it, which I'm, I'm pretty much not buying perishables right now. Um, I have, if you have a corner of your house that you just don't use or don't walk into that often, like I have a dining room that we don't use the dining room that much and it's kind of near the front door. So I'll just have those packages sitting outside in the front door. Okay. If it's not pouring rain or something, they can sit there for a while. I think that the outdoor, the humidity um, in normal conditions is less friendly to this virus. Um, and then I'll bring things in. And uh, first, I'm real careful about door handles and things like that. So I'll open the door. I'll pick up the package. I'll walk into the dining room and put it down. I immediately go wash my hands. I went through proper hand washing technique, which I think is extremely important in uh, my first video on uh, coronavirus. Um, I go wash my hands, come back, and yeah, I've already shut the door, by the way, just with my foot, I've kicked it closed, so skipped that. Um, I'll write on an index card or I'll take a marker and write on the package itself, if I can, the date, and then just walk away. And I won't touch that package for several days. Pick how many days you want. Nine is the most conservative I've read. Um, now, the other option you have is, let's say something in that package is, you know, just a surface that can get wet, immersed in water. Maybe it's something that comes in a in a Ziploc type, you know, maybe it's wrapped in, in tight plastic or, you know, maybe it's something washable anyway. Um, then you have this other option if you don't want to pile this stuff up in like the corner of your dining room is you can open the box. Okay, again, you're going to be very mindful that once you've touched that box, assuming, you know, your hands are dirty, you're going to open it. Um, you're going to take the contents of the box and dump them into, I would do it in my laundry room tub sink. Okay, then I'm going to go and wash my hands immediately. And I'll come back with some Clorox cleanup or Lysol and I'm gonna spray this thing down, whatever I've just put in the sink, I'm gonna spray it down. And um, it has to be sprayed so that the surface remains wet for five minutes, okay? And then you can go ahead and rinse it and let it dry. So that's the second way to do it. I prefer the first way because it's just more hands-off and it's just a lot less stress. And I, I'm trying actually to cut down. I don't really want many things to be arriving because it's just a source of stress, how to deal with things coming into the house. So I do think that there is, I'd rather be safe than sorry, so this is what I'm doing. <laughs> Hear my dog shaking off. I'm I'm handling packages with some care and delicacy. I I also set mail aside. Um, I you know I just get the mail, put it down, go wash my hands. I don't go through it. Um, it's gonna sit. Um, okay, so you know, are these measures really extreme? I I think that there I go, touching my face. I've washed my hands. I'm sitting in the house. No worries. Um, I think that. There's, I, this is my opinion and my prediction. I think there's a not so distant drumbeat coming anymore that we are going to have to, as a country, decide that we are going to hunker down and we are just gonna take the hit and we are going to go through a very hard couple of weeks or we're going to go through a much slower, harder several months until we get a vaccine. And, you know, I hear people saying different things and unfortunately it seems there's, there's just not anything in this country anymore that's apolitical. Um, and I, I will say one thing that offends me, and it's not political either way, but I, I hear people saying that, well, we don't really want to tell people this because we don't want to start a panic. Well, okay, that's a little bit to me the same, it's kind of the same issue as what I described in, in my, my reaction to a recommendation that we don't do supplements because, you know, it's just, we don't know. We don't know for sure. And, um, we can't, you know, there's all different ones and some would be better than others. And it sort of says we don't really trust the American public to, you know, parse this out, tweeze out the, the truth and look at the research. So we're just going to have this blanket statement that, no, we don't recommend any supplements. Um, some experts say that, and I covered that in a previous video. I think that, of course, I wouldn't want to instill panic in people. I would want people to behave order in an orderly fashion. But A, I give most of the American people more credit than that. And B, I think it's still important that they know the truth. And then people have to deal with their own feelings. Um, are we going to have some people who panic? Yeah, we are. Uh, we're also going to have some people who underreact. So I think it's just more important that people know the truth. And I think that we have not had a robust enough response to this virus. Um, as I said, I went over in a previous video about washing my hands. I just mentioned it before. I, I think it is extremely important, but I, let's be honest. My common sense tells me this thing is about way more than washing your hands, okay? I think the people in Italy 
probably have known to wash their hands for some time. Um, it looks like we are going to have to get um, we're going to have to double down and get much more committed to this. I also think that we are going to have to find a way to um, to teach our younger citizens the importance of the social responsibility of protecting the other citizens around them. You know, it seems like based on research that's coming out of places where um, they do surveillance testing, which we don't do, we only test people who are sick, um, surveillance testing would indicate that uh, an overwhelming number of people who have this COVID-19 are actually in their 20s and have no idea that they're sick. So they're the ones who are kind of incubating this and carrying it and spreading it. They're not sick. They don't know. I think we're going to have to talk more about that. Um, I'm a little disappointed that we've downplayed some of those aspects. I also think we're going to have to talk more about who's at risk. I think there's too much emphasis only on the extreme risk categories where people are much more likely to die. For example, the frail or the very elderly, like people over 70, certainly over 80. Um, I think that's good that we talk about that, but I think it creates a false impression for the American public that those are really the only people who are at risk. I listened to an Italian uh, intensive care physician who's in the hospital 18 hours a day working. I think he sleeps there six hours or so. And what he was saying is that we need to learn from them uh, so that we don't have the same uh, result. And that, you know, there are a lot of people who are along a continuum between well and dead. There's a lot in between there. And he said the average age where he's seeing the pneumonias is 40. Most of those people can recover at home, which is nice. He's saying the average age that he's seeing among people with um, illness that requires hospital support, be it um, monitoring or in many cases, intensive care beds, vet respirators, he says the average age for that is 55. So now maybe most of those people are gonna recover because they're not 70 or 80, but if, if you've had that kind of intervention required, uh, you first of all, you might take months to recover. You might have some permanent injury. Um, that's a, a huge strain on a family. I don't think we're really paying enough attention to that. And I think we're creating an impression that really the people at risk are people who are over 80 or people who are really frail with underlying medical conditions. I think there's a lot more people at risk than we're saying, or maybe we're not willing to look at it, or maybe we're inadvertently giving that message, or maybe I'm wrong. But my common sense is telling me that we need to we need to speak more candidly and more thoroughly uh, about the risks of this illness. Um, so what else am I doing? Okay, besides being very careful, not having contact with people, I do go outside for walks. I think it is really important to just get outside. I walk around my yard. I, I'll walk around on our sidewalk. If if I see somebody coming down the street, I'll, I'll cross the street. Um, I think being outside and getting some old-fashioned sunshine and, and just being able to think a little bit, it just feels more positive being outside. Um, kind of doesn't matter what the temperature is out. I think it's important. And um, I can't say I recommend that if you are in a densely populated area inside of an apartment. Um, I think hopefully you can be near, decide you're gonna be near a window for 10 minutes and open it up, even if it's cold, okay? Um, decide that you're going to um, just be on your balcony for a little while if you have that. I, I just think if there's a way to get outside without putting others at risk um, for a little while each day, that's important. I'm also sort of doing a risk benefit analysis of any activities. so. Um, you know, let's say you ride a bike every day for exercise. You go for a vigorous bike ride, a certain mile radius around your, uh, near your home. You know, while I think overall bike riding is very safe and it's good exercise, right now I am doing everything I can to avoid any unnecessary contact. So any non-essential appointments I have canceled. I certainly don't want to be in a position to have to encounter the healthcare system. A, I don't want to displace somebody who needs care for something like a coronavirus. And B, I don't want to be exposed to all the, you know, that's probably the worst place to be right now. I don't want to have to go to doctor's offices. I don't want to have to go to hospitals. So I, I, some people are going to disagree with me, but I'm not going for bike rides right now. I'm taking brisk walks, okay? Maybe I'll turn my ankle. I can put it in on ACE bandage. I don't really need to get seen for that. Um, I'm probably a little extreme with that, but I think all of us are going to have to get a lot more extreme if we really want to beat this thing quickly. Um, 
If I had to go out, I would consider a mask. Again, I remember, you know, reading a couple weeks ago, and I think even yesterday, no, the mask isn't recommended. Okay, again, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. I think you, if you're at some risk, um, I think one of the reasons they don't recommend the mask, they don't say, is that a mask, I just know this from working in operating rooms for 30 years, a mask is a constant source of touching your face because you're adjusting the mask all the time, squeezing the nose piece. There's, you have to keep your hands off of it. Um, I don't think you want to keep a mask on like for 12 hours. It just gets moist inside from exhaling and um, it's probably not effective. It's probably minimally effective. I don't think we know how effective the thing is. It is definitely better at keeping things in um, than keeping things out. But if I really had to go brave it because something that we just, you know, couldn't prevent happened and I had to go somewhere where I thought it was risky, I would consider putting the mask on, I guess. Now, if you are going to do that, I'm not recommending it. You have to make your own decision. But if you are going to do that, you do have to be careful how you put it on. Uh, you wash your hands, you put the mask on, you don't touch your face at all. When it comes time to take the mask off, you wash your hands first then you take it off, right? Because your hands are getting near your face again. You take the mask off, you throw it away. Now your hands are dirty because they touch the mask. You go wash your hands again, okay? If you're going to do it, that's the way you're going to do it. Um, I read some really um, nice things, uh, an idea for an activity, especially if you're home with young children, and I think anybody can do this. Virtual visits, either by Skyping or FaceTiming or writing letters, wouldn't be virtual then, writing letters, to people who are in um, assisted living facilities, because many of our assisted living facilities are kind of locked down because of the risk that the coronavirus pandemic presents to those people. And so they can't see their families right now. Um, I hope their own families are doing that, but I think that it would be a really nice idea. I mean, we're home and we're bored anyway, and I think I'm, I think I'm going to do that. Um, I think even if just set aside, you know, a, say you're going to visit five people a day and it's going to be a five minute call or a, a five minute Skype episode. I, I think that might be a nice thing to do. I think, and I think it's really a good thing for children to learn to do. Um, I do watch the news. I try not to watch the news 24 hours a day. It's usually, you know, there's a cycle and you hear the same thing over and over again. But I mean, right now I am watching things some because I normally, I said in a previous video, I like to read my news, but um, you know, that's not up to the minute news. So, but I'll, I'll just decide when I'm going to watch it. I see what's um, current and what's new, what's come in and then I'm done. Okay. And then I, I take a break from it. I, I don't sit there and just have the thing going all day long. Um, I will say that one thing I like to look at a lot is what they're doing in other countries. Um, I think one country to watch is uh, is Israel. Uh, there's been a lot of countries to watch at how badly this thing has gone. Um, the Israelis, it looks like, have taken extreme measures. Um, they were criticized at first for doing things like not allowing flights in from certain countries. They actually got around that with a brilliant PR campaign um, with China, it was a diplomatic effort and it went over very well. Um, but they said early on that they were going to be instituting measures that were extreme because they decided as a society that their health was more important than anything else and they were going to go ahead and buckle down. They were going to take a big hit to their economy. Tourism was going to be pretty much over because anybody who flies in there has, whether it's their own citizens or not, has to be quarantined for two weeks. Um, and if you're a tourist, you have to prove that you have a place to quarantine. It can't be a hotel. Um, they have limited gatherings to no more than 10 people, and they have to be a certain number of meters apart. Um, and even at that, they're still seeing spread. And as of today, I read that they are thinking of instituting a complete uh, two-week quarantine for everybody except for essential people. So that would be like people who restock um, some grocery stores, hospitals, medical clinics, and um, pharmacies and things like that. Um, that's a very tough thing to do, um, but uh, it looks to me like if we don't want to end up like Italy, um, we're, we're, I predict we're going to have to do something like that, or we're just going to drag this thing along until, until we get a vaccine, which I, I hope is soon. Um, so I am watching some news, and I am making an effort to look at what countries have done what and who's had success. The final thing I'm doing, which I think is really important and really positive, is I'm trying to think of this, and I, I don't have the rights to this one. I got an email from somebody who sent, sent this, this thought around that, think about this, you don't really ever have certainty anyway. What's so upsetting, of course, the disease and the, 
the harm that this is causing and, and the sorrow. But what's scary when you're scared about it coming to you is that you feel like you've lost your sense of certainty. And if you think about it, you don't have that certainty anyway. We don't have any certainty. We've all had things happen in our lives where something got canceled or something, someone got hurt or someone we love passed on or just all kinds of things. We don't have certainty. Um, that's not to say I'm going to you know, go out and put myself in a crowd and put myself at risk right now, but we had an illusion of certainty before this. But maybe this is a good reminder about how fragile life is and how uh, valuable um, the people that we love are. Um, I do meditate every morning. I actually did a video a few weeks ago about, I said that it's one daily habit that can make everything else better in your life. I'll say that in my experience, the last couple of weeks, I've had a hard time meditating. It's, it's harder to not let my mind wander. Um, there's different ways to meditate. And sometimes I, I'm, what I do is I decide I'm going to go through and think about everything and everybody that I'm thankful for. And I think that can be really helpful in a time like this um, to just kind of reset your brain a little bit or, you know, just bring it back from that extreme place. I don't want to lose sight of what's going on here, but I still want to make sure to readjust and recalibrate um, my psyche a little bit so that I haven't lost touch with everything that I'm thankful for. I'm, I can sort of quarantine myself in my home. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that I have a, my husband can work from home. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm educated enough that I've sort of watched this evolving and that I, I have a lot of skills and education behind me that I can um, figure out what to do. I, I have so much to be thankful for. Um, I think if you do that, it will just, it'll just help take you off of that extreme edge first thing in the morning. Um, it's a nice reset. Um, I'll tell you a couple things I'm thankful for. I know I said a, a couple videos ago, my mom had passed away. I'm sad about that, of course. Um, and I was particularly upset at that time about the timing. Uh, what I didn't say in that video is that my, I, I went in for some surgery. It was no big deal. I had some surgery on Valentine's Day. And when I woke up from surgery, my husband told me that my mother had gone into the hospital. And not even 36 hours later, she passed away. I couldn't fly. And I couldn't go to the funeral. And now I realize that if she had hung on and that had happened two weeks later, I couldn't be as prepared as I am now. So you never know when something bad is really for the best. Um, you know, yesterday I was outside on my porch and I had the dog with me. And he's he stays near me. I, I didn't have him on a leash. He, I was right up on my porch. So I have a long walk. Well, around the corner came a big family with a dog, and he perked his ears up, and I thought for a split second, oh, no, and I managed to get him to stay. I got a hold of him, and he, he wasn't struggling against me or anything, but if I hadn't noticed that or gotten a hold of him right away, I would have had him mixed in there, and I would have had to go get in with all these people. Um, I'm really thankful that the dog gave me that lesson, so now I know when I go out there today, I put a leash on him, I got the lesson without the consequences, okay? It didn't actually happen. Every day, there's so much to be thankful for, and it can just, I think for me, it just really helps me to cope with the, the scary, um, the nature of this pandemic that, that's not even peaked. It, we're just in the beginning. Um, so... I'd like to hear your suggestions. I'd like to hear what you're doing. If, if you're not already, I really hope that you will consider that you will stay home. Okay, everybody, I, I really hope that we can come together as a country. I think we're going to learn one way or another that we need to. And um, we need to stay home. We need to protect ourselves and we need to protect other people. We need to make this ugly virus go away. Okay. And um, I uh, want to just commend all the people uh, who are working around the clock, our, our state officials, our federal government officials, um, all the first responders, all everybody, doctors and nurses, and I, I just can't say enough and thank all these people, um, people who are uh, working on a vaccine. Thank you. Um, we have so much to be grateful for. So I, I guess that I'll be putting out a few videos while I'm in captivity here. And I really want to hear what you're doing. And I really would like to hear your feedback. And by the way, I've got some new subscribers in the last few days. And I value every single one of you. But thank you so much for subscribing. And I hope you'll find it helpful. And until then, next time.
Be safe and be well.